calling Coach Joe Moglia here, Coastal Carolina University. <phone rings> Going to get some help with my fantasy football team. Football, this is Jill speaking. Hi, Jill. It's Mike Shoulder, uh, wave maker, calling for Coach Joe Moglia. Hi, Mike. Uh, hold on just one moment. Let me transfer you, okay? Thanks a lot. You're Hi, Michael. Joe Moglia here. Hi, Coach Moglia. How are you? I'm good, thanks. So listen, I, I understand. Uh, well, first of all, I and, and I don't know, many, millions of other Americans are right now obsessed with something called the fantasy football draft. I understand you don't play fantasy football. No, I really have never had time to do that, but I can appreciate almost everybody I know is involved with it. My son and my sons-in-laws are involved with it. I can appreciate how hot it is nowadays. All right, so I'm calling you because you are the coach of Coastal Carolina University's football team, and the name of your team is? The Coastal Carolina Shauna Clears. And where, where, what division are you in? Where should we be looking for you? And we are, we play in the Big South Conference. We are in Division One FCS, Football Championship Series, subdivision. Okay, so here's my question for you. First of all, even though you don't play fantasy football, I know you have a lot of insights about how to choose players for a team. That's what you do. And what I want to find out is the Joe Moglia way of choosing players, because here's my issue. I want, I've been playing fantasy football for two years and I've been frustrated. I want a team that I can root for, win or lose. That's what I'm looking for. So before we get into how to choose that team, I want you to give people listening to this on WaveMaker or wherever else they're listening to it, wavemaker.me, I want you to give them a sense of your personal story in just a few minutes, rags to rags to riches to wherever you are now. Give us the trajectory. You're talking about the Joe Moglia piece of this? I'm talking about the Joe Moglia piece so that when we get your advice on how to pick players, we know where you're coming from. Got it. Okay. Um, my father was born in Italy, moved to this country when he was 11, uh, never finished eighth grade, sold bananas and apples in the Bronx his entire life. Uh, my mother was an Irish immigrant. She came here in her 20s. She never finished high school. Uh, the seven of us, I was the oldest of five. The seven of us, uh, lived in a two bedroom, one bathroom apartment in the Dykeman street section of New York city, which back then and currently still is a gang area. Uh, two of my very best friends from grammar school got killed in high school. One died of a drug overdose. The other was killed by the police robbing a liquor store. Had I not been playing high school football, I would have been with the guy that was robbing the liquor store. Um, my goal was to play football and baseball in college. My girlfriend winds up getting pregnant. I have to give up sports. Uh, I wind up staying near home. I go to Fordham University. Um, I am supporting my wife, my daughter, and putting myself through school. My freshman year, I'm driving a New York City taxi cab, a truck for the post office, and working at my father's food store. And uh, that was a tough first year, and the one thing that was missing in my life was sports. So the Fordham Prep, where I'd gone to school, was good enough to give me a high school coaching job. Uh, so my last three years in college, I coached high school football during the season, uh, worked for my father in the store during, during the off season. I majored in economics, wanted to go to Wall Street, but I really love coaching. And I decided that if I could get my own head high school football program upon graduation, I'd pursue a career in coaching. If not, I was going to go to Wall Street. Uh, bottom line, at 22, I've become the youngest football coach in the history of the state of Delaware. I coached 16 years. I'm proud of everything that I was doing from a football coaching perspective. I thought one day I would be the head coach at a major college in this country. Uh, it's our first year. Uh, fast forward a little bit, and now it's my 14th year coaching. It's my first year as defensive coordinator at Dartmouth. Um, my wife and I were having some difficulty. I had four kids. At the, we had four kids. Uh, and we were going through a divorce. I couldn't afford to support my wife and four children and live independently, so I got permission to move into a storage room above the football office at Dartmouth. Now, the problem, it had no heat. I could see my breath in the wintertime, and I lived there for two years. In January 84, uh, Nebraska was upset by Miami for the national championship. Shortly after that, I was, I was offered an opportunity to join the Miami staff. The problem was that's 1,000 miles away from New Hampshire where my kids are going to live. A football coach in season works seven days a week. You don't get a day off. Back then, I could not afford to bring my kids back and forth. 
or fly him around. So I didn't think I could do my job as a coach if I didn't live up to my responsibility as a father. Now, but by the way, let me interrupt that. You couldn't afford to fly your kids around. How much were you making at that time, and how much would you, would you have made if you took the job in Miami? Uh, I was making thirty three grand. Uh, as defensive coordinator at Dartmouth, and I was told that I was the highest paid defensive coordinator in the league uh, to take the same job at Dartmouth. It would have been, at Miami probably would have been the high 30s. And, and if I remember correctly, that, 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 that period in the 1980s, those were boom times in Wall Street, right? Yeah, they were great. They were good times on Wall Street. Certainly, yeah, they were good times on Wall Street. The real boom times on Wall Street, I think, in the equity markets came in the 90s with the dot-com boom. Gotcha. So, okay, so, you, you, so you're at Dartmouth, you're offered Florida, you turn it down. What happens? Yeah, I'm offered Miami. And uh, the toughest part about that is I realized that I've got to get out of football. So the, I always had an interest on Wall Street, and uh, I aggressively pursued that. And ultimately, I was given an opportunity to go to Merrill Lynch. And they put me in their institutional MBA training program. There were 26 of us, 25 MBAs, and one football coach. I think everybody at Merrill Lynch, almost everybody at Merrill Lynch said, this guy's never going to make it here. Uh, but that worked out. That worked out reasonably well for me. I'm incredibly proud of the career we had at Merrill. Uh, then in 2001, when we had the dot-com bubble having burst and we had online brokerage firms in this country were going through some serious stress, Ameritrade was one of those companies. Uh, they were potentially going out of business. They did a national search. They offered me the job. I wound up taking the job in 2001. In 2008, uh, and I'm the CEO at, at Ameritrade, we have financial Armageddon in this country, fi financial world's blowing up, and we have our sixth record year in a row. And over that period, we actually outperformed every financial firm in the world. And I thought the timing was right for me to step down as CEO. And we announced that I would do that. The board asked me if I'd stay on as chairman. And I'd gotten incredible opportunities to do things in the media, to do things in the business world. But then I got a call from a group of alumni associated with Yale telling me at the end of the 2008 season, there was a possibility the Yale job would be open. Would I be interested? And I remember literally taking the phone, looking at it like this and saying, I haven't coached for 20 years, guys. And they said, but we've spent a lot of time doing our due diligence, and we know, we think, that the skill sets that are required of a college coach, Joe, you've got those, you should think about it. Bottom line is, I did think about it. And, and I found months later, I didn't lose a second of sleep on any of the other possible opportunities. But, but for me, I've always been intellectually attracted to the strategy of the game, the ability to put together an entire program organization. I've always been able to do that. But then having an impact on the people that you work with has always been special to me. And truly helping an 18- to 22-year-old boy actually become a man, I can't imagine doing too many other things with your life that are more rewarding or satisfying. So I made the decision to go back to football. The only issue with that is it never happened before. Uh, I was blessed. Bo Pelini and Tom Osborne gave me an opportunity to work at Nebraska for a couple of years. In 2011, I was the head coach of the United Football League. Uh, other coaches in that league were Jim Fossil, uh, Denny Green, Marty Schottenheimer, Jerry Glanville. That was a great experience. Then in 2012, I had the opportunity to come to uh, Coastal Carolina, the 2013 season. Now we're getting ready for our second season here. So I've coached football for 21 years, but 16 the first time around, five so far this time around, and in between there, I spent over 20 years on Wall Street. And that's so, and that's, that's and that's 20 years on Wall Street. You basically started at the bottom of Merrill Lynch, worked your way up to the executive committee in how many years? Uh, I began as an institutional trainee and a bond salesman. I did well as a bond salesman. I ultimately got to the executive committee of the institutional business uh, after about six, seven years, and then I was transferred to the executive committee on the private client business a few years after that. Now, I had, I, I'm proud of what I did at Merrill Lynch, and I'm proud, frankly, of what we did at Meritrade. Okay, and, and by the way, just in terms of your success, you took, when you entered Ameritrade as CEO, the stock market valuation of that company was what? And what was it when you left the CEO job? When I got to Ameritrade, our market cap was $700 million. When I stepped down in 2008, it was over $10 billion. Yeah. So tell, me some, so tell me something. Why didn't I know you back $700 million? That, I could have used you back then. Well, if you were paying attention to the finance, financial markets, Michael, and you watch what was going on in the financial world, you would have gotten to know me. So there's no excuses. Okay. Well, no excuses. But here, now I know you now, and I know something, that in Wall Street, 
Past performance, people often bank on past performance, right? As a predictor of future performance, true? People think of it that way, but you can't count on that. Can you count on it in football? You can't count on our football. The fact that somebody had a good year the previous year doesn't mean he's going to have a good year this year. The fact that you were successful uh, using a particular type of strategy doesn't mean that's necessarily going to be successful the following year. People adapt and adjust. A good analogy might be uh, 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 hitters that, that, that come into Major League Baseball the first time around. They do reasonably well because the pitchers don't quite understand their strengths and weaknesses. They adapt and adjust. They make it tougher on them. So history is good for informational purposes, but you can't count on history to make a decision going forward. It's one of the data points you use to make your decisions going forward. And I can see where you're getting to here on the fantasy football selection thing. All right, so now we're gonna go back to, so past performance, future predictor. I, I learned this the hard way. My first year in fantasy football, it was designed to be a fam, extended family bonding experience. First year, our first draft choice was Chris Johnson, Tennessee Titans, had the record from the previous year. This guy was going to blow everyone out. We were, we were going to kill with this team. The man could barely make a first down. After the first game, my son wanted to get rid of him, trade him. I said, you got to give people a chance. We gave him a chance the second week, the third week, the fourth week. I eventually had to do a story. I, I consulted with uh, a sports performance psychologist to try to see is there some word we can get to this guy to help him perform because my fantasy team is, is real. So here's my question for you. We learned, I learned the hard way, past performance doesn't necessarily guarantee this year's performance. So excuse that phone beeping, but tell me something. How do you choose players for your team? Well, maybe it makes sense to talk about the guys that we actually, actually recruit. Number one, and it may not be perfect for fantasy football because you already have a pool of players you are picking from. But with regards to us, uh, we're not going to recruit a guy that we don't think can play that can help us compete at the national level. But of the guys that we, we, we are recruiting that we believe can play, the next most important criteria is that he has good character. Somebody that doesn't have good character is not the type of person you want in your program. Uh, so if you were to make a segue then, I think, to fantasy football, I think that's part of it as well. So number one, who are the better players? But also, who are the ones you know you can count on? Who are the ones that also have a history of, of a high level of character performance? They're not the ones getting in trouble. They're not the ones you know they're going to be a person. They're going to be working hard. They're going to be working on the skills, their techniques, their responsibilities. They're going to be doing their film work. That has a lot to do with actual output. And if I were a fantasy football guy, I think I might be paying more attention to Moneyball. Who are the ones that everybody's not necessarily talking to? So they may not be the all-pro guy, and it may not be the guy getting multi-millions of dollars, but it's a rookie or a second or a third-year guy that has a lot of production and is not necessarily in the limelight like somebody else is. I would spend a lot of time doing the Moneyball thing I think, if I were a fantasy football guy. Tell me, is that the way you choose stocks to invest in or any investments? I begin, if I'm looking at stocks, again, I think uh, history is one data point that I want to look at. But if I'm making a decision going forward, I've got to feel comfortable that, that the business plan and strategy that that particular company has is one that is executable. Something that sounds smart, doesn't, can't necessarily get, be executed on. And then I'd have to find what kind of catalyst exists for the marketplace to respond positively to what that particular company is doing. You got involved. And, that, and this gets to a point that I've heard you talk about before, that coaches, football coaches in college and professional football, they tend to look at who the other teams are interested in, and that whets their appetite. You have a different approach. Tell me your approach. Yeah, well, now you're talking about recruiting. I think what happens at the college level, coaches work so incredibly hard, they're exhausted, frankly, by the time they wind up, wind up having to actually recruit. And what happens oftentimes is that multiple coaches are looking at the same kid. So if you're looking for support literally from your other coach. And you don't say this. It's not a quid pro quo, but it happens subconsciously. If I'm supporting you for a kid that you believe in, even though I don't necessarily see the same thing on film, I'm kind of looking for the same thing back. Now, that's not talked about, and it's not, it's not an official quid pro quo, but it happens subconsciously. Why? It's human nature. Secondly, though, when you're recruiting a kid and you've had a chance to evaluate him, 
and you like them, and maybe other guys on the staff don't, the selling point they use is not how good he actually was on film or how well he handled himself under pressure or what kind of character he has, what kind of home life he's got, or what, what his grades are. They start to talk about who else is recruiting him. So if you're in the Ivy League, for example, and you say, you know, I'm, if, I'm working at, if I'm working at Princeton and I want to get a guy in there, and I'm being hypothetical, but if I'm working at Princeton, I worked at Dartmouth, so let me use Dartmouth as an example, and I kind of like a kid, but the rest of the staff may not be crazy, crazy about, and I say, well, Harvard and Yale and Princeton are recruiting this kid. There's a good chance that our staff is going to start to change their mind. Those are the wrong reasons. Those are the wrong reasons. You really have to do your own homework and your own due diligence, and it's got to be independent of each, each other. And who else is recruiting them is a little bit irrelevant until you decide who you're going after, and then all those things are important. You took it one step further in a, in a conversation we had a while back, too. Not only is this somebody you really want, but you decide who you want based on what happens if the other team gets him, put it in your own words, because you really expressed it well when I heard you. Yeah, I think when we're doing that with our own staff, we begin with three different evaluations. So you have the recruiter. He's the geographic guy. So he's looking at a guy first. If he likes the guy, he, he moves the guy to what we call the bank. The position coach looks at the guy in the bank. And then if he likes him, he moves him to what we call the board. And then the coordinator signs off on him. So we have three independent evaluations. Sometimes there's, there's conflict and all three guys don't necessarily agree, and then that conflict will wind up coming to me. And one of the questions I ask is, okay, if we didn't get this kid, how would we feel if he were playing in our league, at our serious competitor, how would we feel if he were competing against us? In the business world, same thing. You're looking to hire a, a senior executive, and you're not quite sure whether or not you want to go in that direction, ask yourself, how would I feel if that guy were competing against us in, in, in the business world? And if the answer is, I don't want that guy competing against us, you probably answered it. You should be going after him yourself. So, Coach, I want to stop right there. That's one of those moments I think worth pausing on because you are talking about complete inner directedness, right? It's, it's if, I, I don't, if I don't want to face that guy as the opposition or that woman as the opposition, that's the person I want on my team, right? Yeah, now you've got it. The only other thing I throw in that with Michael is the idea of character. Okay, remember, if there's a character issue, then I don't care who the person is. Then we don't need them on our team or in our business. But assuming the character's there and you're a little bit undecided, that's not a bad question to ask. How would you feel competing against that person, whether it's on the field, uh, whether it's in fantasy football, or whether it's in the business world? And how you answer that question probably determines the decision you should be making. And how do you answer the question of what makes good character and how can you possibly assess it in the limited amount of time you have? Well, I think as a coach, one of the things you do, you're always going to talk to the high school coach. But almost always, the high school coach is going to positively represent his kid. So one of the things that we try to do, we try to talk to one of his teachers. So we make sure we're talking to one of his teachers and, or we're talking to the guidance counselor. We always want to be able to talk to a parent. We always want to visit the home. And we frankly get a feel for what kind of character the kid has. If he's not a particularly good English student, but he's going to class all the time, he's getting his homework in, uh, he's respectful in class, that's a very, very positive suggestion. How he treats his mom and dad in the home is a positive suggestion. What is he doing away from the football field uh, that would demonstrate, its actions always speak loud in the words, that would demonstrate what kind of person he might be, what kind of character he might have, and we try to do our due diligence on that. Okay, so let me switch, we're going to switch back and forth, Sp football business, football business. If only more business people, business leaders, use that evaluation method to hire their employees, would that be better, actually, for, for their bottom line? If they... If they can do a better job, I think absolutely. Anytime you can get more information on an individual, the better off you are. So at the business, at a senior level in the business world, anybody that comes in is going to be articulate. They're going to be well-dressed. They're going to, they certainly already have significant expertise in their particular area, but you don't know that. And they could easily do well quotes in an interview, but you need to know how they're going to handle themselves under stress. You need to know how they're going to handle themselves under pressure to get a real feel for whether or not that person's got the character that you want with you when things are not going particularly well. So you need to be able to get, get to somebody that knows you and will absolutely, 
absolutely shoot very, very straight with you, but also knows the other person. Well, this is interesting because I, I, I did a conversation once with a guy named Kevin Dutton. He's at Oxford University. He wrote a book called The Wisdom of Psychopaths. People can hear the interview on wavemaker.me. And it's fascinating because he, 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 a, a, he did a study and research of highly functioning psychopaths, people who are just they lie so well you would never know it. They charm the pants off you. Have you ever been suckered by a, by a person like that who just looked good on paper, who seemed good, who sold you, and you got burned? The answer is I have, Michael, but when that happens, that's my fault because that means I haven't done my homework. So unless I already truly know that person, and by that I mean I know how he or she is going to handle themselves under pressure, when things are not going well, will they own up to it? Will they understand what's going on? Can they communicate clearly? Uh, do they not try to kind of shade what they're saying because it makes them look better or wants to kind of cover themselves? And when things are not going particularly well, I need to know that if it's a significant position. So I have to know that. And the only way I'm going to find that out is by either having already worked with that person or talking to somebody that I know well enough that can shoot straight with me about how that person functions under that type of situation. Okay, now you take a kid who's got basically good character, but character evolves over time and it builds over time or doesn't build. And you do something in your practices apparently once a week that other coaches don't do. I don't know if any coaches do. You take a certain amount of time out of that practice period each week to do what? Tell us about this and how it relates to character and building a complete player and an individual. Yeah, what we do is we just call it life after football. And at the end of the day, the average, average age of a guy in our team is about 20. The average tenure in the NFL is about two years. So even if every one of our players was good enough to get to the NFL and actually play, the average tenure there is two years. With the demographics of our country where it is today, a guy at 20 his football career is over at 24, 25. So he's got this much of his life left in football. He's got this much of his life left as far as what he needs to do in terms of his career path, how he's going to take care of his family, the decisions he's going to make in, 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 in terms of what career path that's going to be. Ultimately, what's going to determine his productivity, his own personal happiness later on in life. So how sad is it? How sad is it to get the football piece right, but to get the life piece wrong? So the reality is, and we want to compete at the national level. We're not making any bones about that. We want to win. We want to do all those things. But we think we'll do a better job of preparing our guys for their life. And then we think the football thing will follow. So every week we give up about a half an hour of practice. Not every practice. Every week we give up a half an hour of practice. And the team meets with me. And we don't spend time talking football at all. We spend time talking about issues that would come up in the real world. So last year, for example, we talked about uh, the wisdom about getting behind the wheel of a car if you've been drinking. Uh, we had 9-11, so they gave us an opportunity to talk about terrorism. They gave us an opportunity to talk about democracy and the role of the military in our society today. Last year, we had an election year. They gave us an opportunity to talk about Obama and Romney and how important that was. Uh, later on, remember, the, I forget the, the kid's name, but there was a linebacker, I think, for the Kansas City chief that killed his girlfriend, left a nine-month-old daughter, and then ultimately committed suicide. Half of our kids come from single-parent homes. They gave us an opportunity to talk about domestic violence. Then they gave us an opportunity to talk about suicide, what causes suicide, it's depression. How do you handle depression? How do you actually pick a career path? Those are the types of things that we would talk about in that room. And, and I think, frankly, it's, 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 it's one of the more important things, I think, that we actually do for our guys. So as a result of this, have you actually had players come to you and say, you know, Coach, after you talk, I think I'm suffering from depression? When we had our talk on depression, we said one of the solutions is you need to be able to reach out to somebody that cares about you, that understands what you might be able to go through, at least be able to talk to somebody. It might be a best friend. It might be a family member. And remember, our coaches are always available. We had about 110 guys on our team. In the next two weeks, I had nine of our players come in and meet with me. Nobody came in and said, Coach, I'm depressed. But they wanted to come in and just talk. And I don't know if that would have happened without, without having that specific conversation. All right, so now we get back we're, we're from the real world. We're, t we're translating it to the fantasy world, but, but they're, they're sort of interconnected because here's what I want to do now, and here's what, what maybe others want to do. I want to create the kind of fantasy team that has the values and the kind of character that you, Coach Moglia, are looking for in your team. So give me the guidelines again 
as it applies to fantasy football. So I can create this team that my son and I can root for whether they win or lose on any given Sunday. Okay. Now, you've already expressed the fact that, you know, your son may not agree. So recognizing that, uh, there'd be a couple, first of all, as far as the character goes, remember, you don't know these guys individually. You're not going to have that perspective. But you do have an idea of the people that are kind of problem, trouble, troublemakers, et cetera. I don't know if I want them on my team, period. So, okay, so that's the only way I think I'd handle the character issue. The ones that are supposed to be issues, I'd assume they're issues. That may be not fair, but th that's the assumption I make because you don't have the time. You can't, you not have the, don't have the ability to wind up doing the due diligence. Then I'd look at the data. Then I'd look at all the statistics. I'd spend a lot of time pouring over that. And then for some of the players that, that haven't, that are really not particularly well known, but they have pretty good production, I'd be going after some of those guys. And that's that's where I would begin. Now you always know you always know that you need a quarterback. But while I'm not sure the way fantasy football works, I would guess that not everybody's going to be able to get Peyton Manning. So you're going to be able to get somebody else that again has good production, but he may not be the name that somebody else is thinking about. And I bet you the names because everybody that plays fantasy football are fans. And they're the ones that know the people. So that's like a recruiter in college saying, oh, we want to recruit this guy because our com competitors, our competition, the other schools are going after this guy. Well, everybody likes the names that you're sort of fans on. Pay attention to the ones that are a little less the big name guys but have really good production. And I think you'll probably round out a pretty good team. Good production but less of a name. Those are, in a sense, the hidden gems. They're the ones I think you'll get more of. Gotcha. Coach, I just want one final question. I, I want to come back to this half hour a week you carve out of your practices because that can be applied in any walk of life. It's, it's a fascinating concept. It's a half hour out of how many hours of practice a week? Uh, your foot, the NCAA allows your football team to be together in effect for 20 hours, 20 over the span of the week. Our practice time is much less than that. Our practice time is probably... Eight hours a week, eight hours a week. So of the eight hours a week, we take 30 minutes. Which uh, you're better at math than I am. So what percentage of your practice time a week is devoted to talking about life? One sixteenth. And, and that one sixteenth, you feel you're getting a lot of bang for it? Well, it's, I think, yeah, I think we get an incredible amount of that. Now, in fairness, there's always going to be a handful of guys at those meetings that are not paying attention. They don't feel it's relevant, and they're thinking about something else, whatever it might be. But, but most of the guys are paying attention to that. And remember, we always make it relevant. And what they need to understand is there's no reason. They understand that we've got practice. They understand we've got things to do. And we're saying we've taken time away from that because this is so important. And we are making it relevant. We're not just, this is not, we're not reading something to them. We're not bringing in somebody that's lecturing. We're talking about something that's gone on that week or is taking place in the world that they should be aware of anyway. So now finally, if we want to follow Coastal Carolina University this year, what should we be looking for? What, what can you tell us about your team strategy that, that won't give away the game, but that we might find interesting and, and might help us see something different as we watch college football, whether it's related to your team or other teams you know, what should we be looking for that people often don't notice? Well, I think, I, I think one of the, the first thing that I would say, and people may or may not notice it, but the first thing I would say is that, you know, we've got a mission to put a team on the field that all the coastal, the entire coastal community is going to be proud of. And that means we're expected to win and have exciting brand of football, but it also means you never take a snap off. So hopefully anybody watching our team play, you never, ever, ever on any snap, see somebody take it easy. Uh, with regards to the rest of it, I think what we try to do is do a better job of adapting and adjusting the strengths of our players to the to the to what we're try to what we're trying to get done on the field in a way that gives a competitive advantage. So, for example, offensively, we have the ability to run the ball fifty times a game or throw the ball fifty times a game. But what we'll do is we'll try to do what you're giving us. So one game we might literally run or throw the ball fifty times a game because that's what you're giving us. But we're prepared most of the time to be balanced. But we won't hesitate to be aggressive one way or the other. And we think that gives us a competitive advantage, emphasizing the strengths that our guys have versus something that the opponent may not be quite so strong at. So you're really talking about one word, improvisation. 
Competitive edge. I call it to adapt and adjust competitive edge. So I give you four or five words. Okay, fair enough. And never take a snap off. I never heard that phrase. Is that is that a common football phrase? Well, a snap is when the ball is snapped to the center. So it's a play. So you would never take a play off. Right. You'd ever take a play. So a snap would be common, certainly amongst coaches. A play would be probably be more common amongst fans. What, what I'm saying is that that uh, that phrase, that the way you framed it, never take a snap off. Six, never take a snap off. Five words. Has it ever been framed that way? I think it has. I think a lot of coaches would say that. I think with us, the difference piece is that's our entire mission. Our entire mission is to put a team on the field that all the Coastal is going to be proud of. And that means no one, no one that follows us or is part of the Coastal community ever sees us on the field where we take a snap off. That piece is a little different. But coaches don't, coaches want their guys not to take a snap off. They would be saying that. So, sounds like you're a tough coach and, uh, and a sympathetic coach at the same time. I think it's a tough love thing. I think you want to create a standard. I said in the beginning, the reason, one of the reasons why, you know, going back to football, to me, uh, there were a lot of reasons for it. But one of the reasons, the impact that you have on somebody else's life. And you've got to have a pretty high standard to be able to compete at the national level, do all the things that you're trying to do, and really truly have an impact on somebody else's life. I think the key is making sure our guys understand that they got to stand on their own two feet and accept responsibility for themselves, and they got to live with the consequence of, the action, of their actions. Our coaching staff has to believe in that as well, and we, we've, got, we've got to execute that as far as we go and as far as our players go. Coach Joe Mowgli, a former CEO of TD Ameritrade, head coach of the Coastal Carolina University. Give me the name again so we lock it in. The Coastal Carolina Shana Clears. Thank you so much, Coach Moglier, for joining us on Michael Shoulders Wavemaker. Thank you very much for having me, Michael.